This is the European headquarters of the United Nations at Geneva, Switzerland, scene of the Second International Conference on Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy. Here for two weeks in September 1958, 6,000 scientists from all parts of the world exchanged information on recent progress made by their respective countries in the peaceful utilization of the atom. Under UN sponsorship, this great scientific gathering brought about the most important interchange of nuclear data ever effected, nourished the growing spirit of international cooperation, and cemented new friendships among scientists of many lands. 69 nations and nine international agencies were represented when on September 1st the conference was opened by Swiss President Thomas Hollenstein, Dag Hammarskjöld, UN Secretary General, and Francois Perrin, French High Commissioner for Atomic Energy and President of the conference. The 572-man United States delegation was headed by Louis L. Straws, then President Eisenhower's special advisor on atomic affairs, and included our leading scientists, engineers, and administrators. This group brought to the conference a comprehensive program covering the newest developments in the U.S. atomic program. Other countries, too, sent their top scientists to report on their own activities. The 1958 conference was larger in every respect than the historic first Geneva conference of 1955. For two crowded weeks, the delegates listened in four languages to selected papers on virtually every peaceful aspect of the world nuclear picture. More than 2,000 technical papers were submitted for the 77 formal sessions of the conference. 714 of them delivered orally. All were made available not only to the delegates, but also to the more than 900 journalists and radio and television commentators from 36 countries. 722 papers were contributed by the United States. Also of tremendous importance were the opportunities for informal discussion among delegates of the participating nations and for observation of actual experiments underway and equipment in operation in the great technical exhibition covering more than two acres of floor space. Here, 20 nations and two international agencies displayed their newest research findings and practical applications of atomic energy. The United States exhibit was opened officially from Washington by President Eisenhower over a transatlantic telephone hookup. Secretary General Hammarskjöld responded on behalf of the United Nations. Chairman Straws then escorted conference officials and delegates on a tour of the exhibit. The Atomic Energy Commission spent more than two years developing the 64 exhibits with the scientific personnel who manned them. Impressive as were the displays, many of them full-scale operating devices, the U.S. exhibit was far more than a mere collection of machinery and equipment. The scientists themselves were the real heart of both the conference and the exhibits. Many of them brought along portions of their own laboratories and continued their experiments right through the conference. The American exhibit, which covered more than 36,000 square feet, was divided into four major areas of interest. This one was devoted to the physical sciences. Here were nearly a score of demonstration models, one illustrating the decay of mu mesons, and actual experimental devices. This machine disproved the time-honored physical law of the conservation of parity opening new vistas in the study of the behavior of elementary particles, and a bubble chamber used to display the tracks of ionizing particles. This device was demonstrated by a scientist who helped develop the bubble chamber concept. This area also contained a complete radiation chemistry laboratory where the effects of radiation on materials were demonstrated. 
A second area covered the whole field of reactor science and technology. Here were not only models of many reactor types, including the propulsion unit of the nuclear ship Savannah and information-packed descriptive panels, but also operating reactors like this training and research unit. This reactor was used throughout the conference to produce short-lived radioisotopes for the chemical labeling laboratory and other working displays in the life sciences area. Many other exhibits were similarly interdependent. A modern electronic computer center, for instance, performed the calculations for reactor experiments. While the health and safety laboratory, designed primarily to demonstrate American safety standards and equipment, also monitored the entire exhibit continuously to ensure the safety of all personnel. Let's return to the reactor area. One exhibit which excited great interest among the visitors was the Argonaut training reactor, which was assembled in full view of the spectators during the first five days of the conference. This scene was filmed on the opening day, the installation of a shield of concrete blocks. Five days later, the reactor designed by Argonne National Laboratory went critical. On the sixth day, Chairman Straws brought the reactor to full power before an audience which included a number of foreign graduates of Argonne's International School of Nuclear Science and Engineering. One was Munir Khan of Pakistan. The technology of feed materials processing also was demonstrated. A guide, one of 48 multilingual girls employed in the American exhibits, explains the process. The U.S. area of the exhibition hall was a favorite rendezvous for scientists of other nations, many of whom returned day after day to study the displays and to discuss them with the Americans in charge. Blackboards were scattered liberally throughout the area to facilitate these discussions. The members of this interested group are Soviet scientists. To promote the interchange of information in a friendly atmosphere, the U.S. exhibit provided a balcony lounge reserved for delegates and an information center where current American publications on atomic energy were available. Here, foreign scientists were able to obtain technical pamphlets on hundreds of subjects. The center filled requests for more than 35,000 such documents during the conference and acquired many of foreign origin in exchange. Also on the balcony was a four-bay motion picture theater where continuous showings were given of 28 short technical films produced specially for the conference by the Atomic Energy Commission, universities, and industrial concerns. Seventeen longer U.S. films were donated to the United Nations and shown in the Palais des Nations, along with 34 others contributed by other nations. Not all of the more than 100,000 visitors to the United States exhibit were scientists. Every afternoon, the gates were open to all, and the general public responded enthusiastically. Popular with scientists and laymen alike was the life sciences area, where the handling and use of radioisotopes were demonstrated. Exciting new medical equipment was displayed, a photo scanner for localization of tumors, a liquid scintillation counter for analysis of body radiation levels. Nearly 5,000 persons were counted for natural radioactivity. Other displays demonstrated the part played by the rumen, liver, and udder of the cow in the synthesis of milk, a new technique for continuous administration of radioactive substances to laboratory animals. Biosynthetic labeling for the study of plant nutrition and growth and a novel method of diagnosing deviations from the normal structure or functioning of the human heart. Just before the opening of the conference, the United States and Great Britain jointly announced the declassification of their thermonuclear research programs. And the United States unveiled its most promising experimental devices, actual operating machines, like Princeton's B2 Stellarator. These represent the various paths being explored in a quest for a new source of power. Many of these machines were operated throughout the conference. The Princeton exhibit included a model of the university's Stellarator laboratory, 
devoted entirely to fusion research. And a figure eight stellarator. This is one of several devices in which ionized gas or plasma is confined by means of an externally produced magnetic field and superheated in an endless closed container. The magnetic field is generated by strong electric currents which flow in copper wires encircling the ionizing gas. Another approach, the racetrack stellarator, in which the twist in the magnetic field is produced by current flowing through adjacent groups of wires in opposite directions. The University of California Radiation Laboratory exhibit featured a number of devices like the tubular pinch machine, in which electrical discharges are used to produce both the necessary heat, approaching three million degrees, and the confining magnetic field. A similar principle is used in a rotating plasma device in the same exhibit, while other machines demonstrated a number of still different approaches. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory exhibited another method with its direct current experiment called DCX in which molecules of gas are broken up in a carbon arc and then are trapped in a magnetic mirror field. The Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory showed a number of operating devices, including Scylla, in which the plasma is superheated by compression. All of the machines are still in the experimental stage, but from one of these research channels may come the elusive secret of cheap, plentiful power a secret which certainly will be unlocked the sooner as a result of international cooperation. To speed such mutual assistance in all phases of atomic research, the United States presented to the UN and to the leaders of each delegation a set of books covering in great technical detail recent developments in the atomic energy program of this country. A striking demonstration of the results of another phase of the US program of international cooperation was evident in the Lake Geneva cruise of Argonne Laboratories International School alumni. Ninety young scientists from 40 different countries, all American trained, turned out for a day of comradeship and of serious discussion too of their mutual research problems. The commercial aspect of atomic energy was not neglected at Geneva. Here at a separate exposition in a downtown auditorium, Manufacturers of 13 nations exhibited their atomic wares. One interested group of visitors were the American congressional advisors to the U.S. delegation. Here, 52 American firms, coordinated by the Atomic Industrial Forum, assisted by AEC, displayed their products for buyers from all parts of Europe as well as from Asia and Africa. They got keen competition from the British. And the French. And many others, big and little. The atom and its appurtenances had come a long way in the three years since 1955, affecting the lives of people everywhere. Even greater strides may be looked for as a result of this great conference, where the spirit of international cooperation was strengthened in a dramatic and convincing way where a vast amount of new technical information was exchanged, and where new and promising uses of the atom were brought to light. At Geneva, the United States clearly demonstrated once more, by the variety and quality of its participation, its determination that atomic energy shall be transformed from an instrument of war into a servant of all mankind.